All right, in this unit, we turn to behaviorism. Uh, like pragmatism, behaviorism is, historically speaking, a relative newcomer on the intellectual scene. It's uh, primarily a phenomenon of the 20th century, although we can see the roots being laid in the late 19th century. Uh, like pragmatism and also like realism, I think it's fair to say that behaviorism is broadly naturalistic. Uh, like the realists and the pragmatists, uh, they contrast themselves to the idealists who typically are more otherworldly and uh, much more religion friendly in their uh, approaches to philosophy. Behaviorism is uh, rigorously naturalistic in its approach, uh, but more importantly and more distinctively to behaviorism as approach is a, a fairly ruthlessly reductionistic account of human nature. And while with the realists and the pragmatists, the behaviorists are strong advocates of scientific method, uh, uh, behaviorism outstrips both of those in the kind of the ruthless and rather reductionistic way in which uh, it applies scientific method to the understanding of the, the human being. Uh, the behaviorists will argue uh, as the 20th century approaches that it is time for uh, psychology to take its place among the world's sciences. Uh, uh, like many other sciences prior to uh, psychology, uh, uh, they had cut the apron sings, strings, rather, so to speak, from the mother discipline of philosophy over the course of the centuries as the modern world progressed. And by the time we get to the uh, beginning of the 20th century, there's a critical mass of thinkers who argue that it's time for psychology to distinguish itself from philosophy and to establish itself as a science, as a distinctive science with its own subject matter and with its own methodology for, for studying this. Now, the uh, psychologists or the early psychologists who are making the case for psychology as a distinct uh, uh, science, the behaviorists uh, among them, will argue that there's a natural progression that has uh, uh, come about in the modern world uh, as uh, philosophy separated itself from theology in the early modern world, and then progressively over the course of the centuries, uh, the sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, and so forth, established themselves as independent uh, subject matters. So if we do a quick historical tour, we uh, can, for example, go back to the 1600s, and it's in the 1600s uh, that we find physics uh, establishes itself significantly uh, as an independent branch of study, independent subject matter from philosophy, from theology, and a distinctive methodology for studying the, uh, the subject matter of, of physics. Now, this is a hard-fought battle uh, through the latter part of the 1500s and on into the early part of the 15, uh, 1600s, rather. We saw in the case of uh, Giordano Bruno uh, and then Galileo being silenced in the early part of the 1600s. But nonetheless, uh, scientists like Galileo and others of the time did do the foundational work to establish physics as, as a discipline, even if in Galileo's case he was silenced, Bruno was, uh, was uh, uh, burned at the stake and others were, uh, were threatened and intimidated in various ways. Nonetheless, by the time we get to the 1640s and the 1650s, physics is established. And then in the latter part of the 1600s, in the generation of Isaac Newton, physics matures and uh, a significant theoretical framework is developed that then establishes uh, physics for the next couple of centuries. In the 1700s, it is the turn of chemistry. And uh, obviously there had been pre-scientific work or proto-scientific work done in the 1500s, 1600s, and so forth. But it's by the time we get to the 1700s that chemistry matures, uh, can establish itself as an independent science. And one uh, landmark indication of this is toward the end of the 1700s, again, we have the first elaboration and articulation of the periodic table by, uh, I believe, Lavoisier. In the 1800s, it is then the turn of another science, biology. And again, we can see there's lots of proto-biological work being done in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, and so forth. But again, it's not until we get to the middle part of the 1800s that a mature theoretical framework uh, that accounts for or, or, or uh, is in a position to account for all of the major phenomenon emerges. And that is, uh, of course, uh, the Darwin evolutionary theory, or we should probably say the Darwin and Wallace evolutionary theory. Um, 
many thinkers, of course, have been developing the taxonomical schemes uh, that biologists use, working out all of the kingdoms, genuses, and species, and so on, 1700s and 1800s. But Darwin puts it all together. And then uh, in the next generation, Mendel, uh, unknown to Darwin, works out the basics of genetics. And then, so by the end of the 1800s, if you put evolution and genetics together, you've got the modern synthesis that biology then uh, 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 operates within. By the time then we get to the 1900s, right, the first generation of uh, individuals who will describe themselves as psychologists and those whom in retrospect we will, as historians of intellectual life, say here's the first generation of psychologists, uh, they are establishing themselves and making the argument that just as with physics, chemistry, biology, uh, and so forth, it is the turn of psychology to establish itself as a science with its own subject matter and, and methodology uh, as, the, uh, as the other sciences had done so. And then uh, as the 20th century uh, progresses, uh, there turn, uh, is, are, are rather two uh, major frameworks in the first 50 years or so of the, uh, the 20th century that dominate. Uh, there is the, uh, the Freudian framework, sometimes called uh, the psychoanalytic framework. Uh, Freud's first major work, The Interpretation of Dreams, was perfectly uh, timed, published in 1900. Actually, it was uh, published toward the end of 1899, but the publisher put the date 1900 on because, uh, you know, excitement for the new century, right, and so forth. And then uh, competing with the Freudian interpretation is a school that comes to be called behaviorism. Uh, Ivan Pavlov, working in, uh, in Russia, uh, in the later part of the 1800s, uh, Thorndike, John Watson, and then later uh, B.F. Skinner uh, comes to represent a mature version of behaviorism as the, uh, the, uh, the 20th century progresses. Now, uh, these two schools of uh, psychology are in mortal combat with each other, and we're in mortal combat with each other uh, uh, still to some extent uh, uh, to by the end of the 20th century, but these were the two major combatants in the field of psychology. Uh, and what they disagreed with each other on, what, if we're going to understand the human being, where the locus of control or where the locus of causation primarily existed. Uh, one way of characterizing this is to say that the Freudians are strongly internalistic in their, in their discipline. They will argue that if we take seriously Darwinian evolutionary theory, what evolution teaches us, is that human beings come out of a long evolutionary chain uh, and what uh, enabled uh, those uh, species and individuals that survived that long individual uh, evolutionary chain was a fairly powerful set of instincts that were passed on then genetically from generation to generation. Uh, the species that we come out of is a more predatory kinds of species, so we have very strongly aggressive instincts. Uh, the sexual instinct, uh, obviously, is also an important instinct necessary for the propagation of the species. And so if we want to understand the human psyche, uh, particularly the conscious part of the psyche, we should really understand it as being primarily driven by biological forces, by instinctual forces, most of them unconscious, but that manifest themselves in the form of various kinds of conscious urges and, and so forth. So what we have here is a very strongly biologically driven uh, understanding of human psychology. Uh, and uh, if we want to really understand what's going on in our conscious psychology, uh, the conscious psychology really is a superficial phenomenon. It's driven by the unconscious phenomenon or the instinctual phenomenon. And so we need to have various uh, techniques to get at the, the underlying unconscious or subconscious or even instinctual uh, phenomena that really are driving the psychological show so to speak. So we interpret dreams, uh, we do free associations, we try to uh, tap into uh, long buried or repressed memories, and so the project then is very internalistic, trying to get back to the determinative uh, biologically driven events that, uh, that cause uh, 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 human psychology to be what it is. The behaviorists, by contrast, are much more externalistic in their approach to human psychology. They will argue, of course, that we are a product of a, a long line of evolution, but that the end result of evolution in the case of each human being is a very plastic being. That is to say, a being that still is malleable and shapeable 
and not preset to develop in any particular direction. And so the human psyche, uh, whatever uh, is going on there, is something then that is born into a world, uh, but then is shaped and mal uh, uh, made malleable uh, uh, by uh, the environmental and social conditions to which it is subjected to. So what the uh, behaviorists will argue is that it is the environment in which we find the decisive causal uh, and shaping forces, not so much the, the biological forces. That the biological package that we're born with can be shaped into just about anything depending on the environmental circumstances one is exposed to. The Freudians, by contrast, tend to deny that. They will argue that primarily the biological has its own destiny and that the environmental forces uh, at most can uh, tweak things in a direction here, right, or so. Now, what both of these have in common is that they are, uh, especially, particularly when pushed into extreme and, and pure versions of both of these, strongly deterministic accounts of human nature. Uh, they will argue, both of them, that what we call uh, consciousness, uh, the, the apparent uh, self-control, self-regulation, volition, the ability to choose our own thoughts, to uh, direct our own actions, that that is largely an illusion that really what we think, what we feel, what we do is uh, shaped and driven by either environmental forces beyond our control or biological forces uh, beyond our control. That consciousness is, uh, is kind of uh, flotsam to be uh, driven by uh, the underlying uh, sea forces at work here. Now this uh, was the, the, the nature of the debate back and forth uh, for the first part of the 20th century. Uh, sometimes it's just cashed out as the nature versus nurture debate. Is it nature or is it nurture that is, uh, that is really driving the ship of the soul, so to speak? Uh, and this uh, led many thinkers by the time we got to the middle part of the 20th century to argue that both of these deterministic accounts are, are too reductionistic, that they are not capable of uh, fully explaining the human psyche and all of its complexity, including those very issues that it, uh, are features rather that, it, uh, that they want to explain away namely uh, consciousness as, a, as an autonomous uh, uh, capacity with uh, certain self-regulatory abilities, our, our abilities to, uh, to choose and direct our own thoughts and actions in various kinds of ways. And so what happened then by the time we get to the mid-20th century is the development of a third school, which uh, I'm just going to broadly call a cognitivist uh, approach to psychology, but it's an approach that is uh, not as deterministic or reductionist as either of these two here. It will take uh, argue and agree that, of course, there are important imp environmental factors and, of course, biological factors as well, but nonetheless, uh, consciousness uh, is a distinctive causal power that has uh, uh, features that must be understood without uh, being reduced to uh, either environment or, or biology. Now all of that though is to get ahead of our story here. What we're primarily interested in this unit is behaviorism. What made behaviorism possible uh, as, a, as, a, as a movement uh, 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 shaping significantly the development of particularly of psychology in the 20th century and then uh, with great applications particularly in the field of education which is our focus in this course here educational psychology and much of educational practice in the 20th century has been hugely impacted by behaviorism as, as a theory of human nature, hence uh, this unit in this particular course. All right, so the claim that behaviorists are making by the turn of the 20th century is that psychology is now in a position to be a mature, independent science. They'll argue that two things had to happen uh, given the complexity of the subject matter. Human beings are extraordinarily complex. Two things had to happen before uh, psychology could be in a position to, uh, to launch a scientific uh, enterprise uh, with the, the human psyche as, as a subject matter. They'll argue that there are very good reasons why psychology is relatively a latecomer on the scientific scene uh, and that psychology has to build on the achievements of the earlier sciences. And there are two, uh, two important achievements that had to be uh, accomplished here. One is a, a content thesis. What they will argue is that psychology could not happen or could not come into existence as a science if it had not been for the development of evolutionary biology in the, in the 19th century. Uh, that what evolution does is 
enables us intellectually to sever the connections to that pre-scientific, uh, traditional, and in often cases, religious way of thinking about the human psyche in terms of a soul or in terms of an immaterial spirit. As long as we have even a whiff of uh, thinking of the human psyche as uh, partly constituted by or driven by a soul or a spirit, that's uh, some sort of spooky, immaterial, uh, something or other, we're never going to have a science. We're, we're not even going to try to have a science because by definition, a soul or a spirit like that is not going to be amenable to a scientific investigation. So the breakthrough that evolution provides is not to uh, uh, give an account of uh, a biological history and a theoretical account of how particular species came into existence, but it provides that needed psychological break with dualism. Because what evolution does is it makes human beings continuous with all of the other natural organisms that exist right on the earth. Evolution says that what we have is relatively simple organic phenomenon given enough time, developing increasingly complex uh, 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 biological capacities and then rudimentary psychological capacities, uh, organisms that can sense their environments and respond to their environments. And then those physical uh, and psychological capacities develop in increasing complexity over unimaginably long stretches of time until we get beings like dogs and dolphins and chimpanzees and the other primates who are capable of fairly sophisticated uh, uh, psychological activities. And then finally, evolution uh, goes to the point where we get the human psyche, which is another order of complexity uh, greater than, uh, than, some, than many of the other primates. But the idea then is that we don't have the view that somehow human beings and the human psyche is metaphysically special, that in some sense we've got this very complicated physical organism, but a god added this spooky spiritual stuff to the mix, and that's what makes us what we are. Instead, we understand our complex uh, psychological apparatus in terms of underlying complex physical apparatus, the brain and, uh, and nervous system. All right, so that breakthrough had to have to occur before uh, psychology was in a position to say, okay, maybe we can take on this, this complicated psychological apparatus and study it scientifically. The other thing that was necessary that the uh, early psychologists are saying uh, is uh, something that's common to all of the other sciences, and that is a method issue. That uh, there's lots of very complicated phenomena out there, and uh, it takes a while to, to build up scientific method until it's in a position to take on increasingly complicated uh, phenomena. So it was a long, tedious, in some cases, and laborious process of developing the repertoire of tools, analytic techniques, experimental techniques, mathematical techniques, and so forth uh, over the centuries until the scientists are in a position to have a sophisticated enough scientific method to apply to something as complicated as, as human psychology. So the argument here is that scientific method was a long time in the developing, but by the time we get to the 19th century, particularly the latter part of the scientific uh, method, uh, 19th century rather, the tools that the scientists have developed methodologically are sophisticated enough that psychology can, can take its place. Uh, among the sciences here. Now, to break this down a little further, uh, if we are now going to study the human mind, the human psyche, scientifically, what exactly does that mean? Well, and this is where the behaviorists uh, uh, have their particularly ruthless account of what scientific method consists in. So we'll single out two important features. We have to be committed in the first place to observation. Observational data have to be the foundation and the touchstone for all of the conclusions, all of the inferences, all of the theoretical and hypothetical models that we are going to come up with. That if we're not ruthlessly committed to uh, making observational data, whether initial uh, uh, observational data we, we get just from looking at things, or observational data that we acquire through doing uh, rigorous experimentation, if we're not actually committed to that, if we're not willing to put our hypotheses and theories to the observational test, then we're not really being scientific. And that will have important implications a little bit later. The other thing that scientists then do is with all of the things that they observe, they are trying to establish correlations 
And what we will do is try to say, of these things that we are observing in the world, some of them are causes and some of them are effects. In some cases, of course, there are compound effects. So here's a given effect. Here are all of the causal things that we have observed that made that possible. And of course, it can, the complexity can go the other way. From a given causal set of circumstances, there can be manifold effects. But what we need to do is establish in a scientific, law-like, regularized way uh, connections between cause and effect. And these are things that we sometimes call scientific laws, right, or scientific principles. But I'll just put it for simplicity here. We're trying to correlate cause and effect. Establish regularized correlations among all of the observed phenomena. And those are the two primary components of, of scientific method. All right, let's uh, take each of these and talk a little bit further about each, uh, them uh, separately and then see how this uh, works out for behaviorist account of, of psychology here. Let's take this issue of, uh, of observation. Uh, I want to uh, first tell a story that comes from a philosopher, uh, Antony Flew, who had uh, some behaviorist leanings at, at various points in his, uh, his intellectual career. But it's a kind of anecdote that uh, behaviorists uh, will use regularly to kind of test right, whether people are actually committed to observation or whether uh, they are, uh, in some sense, just going through the motions of being scientific, but really they have a pre-scientific uh, commitment to a non-observational uh, uh, or non-scientific way of understanding things. The anecdote that Flew tells uh, involves two jungle explorers. He just asks us to imagine two, uh, two guys who've been out, I believe it was somewhere in Africa, and they've been tramping around for, for months without seeing anybody, and then they come to this clearing, and they both stop, and they're admiring the beauty of this clearing, uh, and uh, what they notice is, and here my years of art school training will come in handy, is that there's a, a stream kind of running through here, and uh, the stream is kind of spilled over a little bit at this area here, so it's a marshy area. And what we have growing in this marshy area are some plants that are kind of marsh-loving plants. Uh, there's a slight rise up over here, and up here things are quite dry and exposed pretty regularly to the sun. What we have up here are some, uh, we'll say, some kind of spiky-looking plants that are quite uh, quite lovely in their own way, but nonetheless, they need a lot of sun and they're, they don't need a, a great deal of water. Over here, uh, we'll say there are some uh, very tall trees. Uh, these tall trees generate a great deal of shade. And then what we have down here, growing at the base of them again, are some, some plants. And I'll draw some fairly broad leaf type of plants down here. Uh, that are, are shade-loving plants and shade-needing plants, and they're not able to, uh, to tolerate uh, a great deal of direct sunlight. All right, uh, and of course, it's more complicated than this. This is just very rudimentary here. But what we have from the two explorers is when they're looking at this, uh, this wonderful clearing, uh, remarking upon its beauties, one of them exclaims, who would have thought that there would be a garden way out here in the, in the middle of the jungle? Right? And the second one says, a garden? Why do you think it's a garden? And the guy says, well, look how beautifully everything is, is organized uh, and how all of the plants have been arranged and, and located in positions where they can get exactly what they need. All of the plants that need a great deal of water are down in the marshy area. The plants that need a lot of sun but not a lot of water, all of them are arranged up here. And the plants that cannot tolerate a great deal of sunlight, they are uh, over here in the shade just where they need to be. Clearly, given the organization and complexity of this structure here, it's a garden. And so there must be someone who uh, planted and tended this garden, uh, a gardener, right, who uh, who's for some strange reason uh, created this garden out here in the middle of the jungle. The second explorer is uh, much more skeptical and says, uh, garden, gardener, there's no uh, garden or gardener here. Instead, what we have is a natural evolutionary process. Right? We have uh, uh, these plants here because last year, the previous generation of those plants went to seed. Some of the seeds were scattered by the wind up here. Some of them were scattered there. Some of them, of course, fell in this marshy area right here. And what happened was the, the seeds that were blown up to this area here, they got baked in the sun. They didn't get enough moisture, and so they just didn't make it. The ones that blew over here uh, didn't get enough sun, so they didn't make it. So only the ones that uh, were blown by the wind, by the, the random processes of the wind, and ended up in this area. 
got uh, established in exactly the right conditions and, and grew here. And so that's why all of those plants are where they are. And the same kind of a story can be told for these ones here. These seeds went to, or the plants went to seed, and only the seeds that ended up in, in the right kind of conditions up here made it. The ones that were blown down over here, they didn't make it, right, and so on. So there's no garden. There's no gardener. Instead, what we have is a complex uh, array of organisms uh, having evolved by purely naturalistic forces. All right, so what we have here in Antony Flew's story is a scaled down version or an allegorical version of the argument from design, right, where the one side is arguing, giving the complexity of certain kinds of natural phenomena. There must be an intelligent orderer behind it, and the other arguing that complex natural phenomena can evolve through uh, 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 unintelligent processes that are purely naturalistic here. But Flew's point is not so much to prove whether there's a gardener or not as to focus on the methodology issues. Uh, and that's why I want to use this story here. To what extent is the person of the debate in this case going to be driven by people's commitment to being scientific, to attending to and letting the observational data speak to the hypotheses in question. Now in this case, the hypothesis is that what we have here is a garden with a gardener competing with the hypothesis that this, there is no garden and there is no gardener. So we have a debate and then they say, okay, well, let's be scientific about this. We should be able to put this to the test. And then we think here's the following kind of test. If there is in fact a gardener, then sooner or later the guy has to show up in order to tend to his garden. So one test that we can run is just to camp out here for a while. We'll enjoy the beauty of the garden and we'll just wait and, and see whether a gardener shows up. If he does, then that's confirmation of the gardener hypothesis. And if he doesn't, then that also will tell us. So they camp out there for a week, for two weeks, a month. Nobody shows up, uh, but everything is going on uh, as, 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 as usual here. And then at the end of the month, the skeptic says, see, I told you there is no gardener. Uh, this is not really a gardener. The guy who believes, though, in uh, uh, the gardener hypothesis, oh, that test doesn't prove anything. The reason why we didn't see uh, the gardener is uh, he's an invisible gardener. It's an invisible gardener who's coming by on a fairly regular basis, tending to the garden, but we're trying to see him with our eyes and listen to him with our ears. But uh, since he's invisible, he's not going to be uh, uh, susceptible to being seen. And so that's why we didn't see the guy. But I'm, I'm convinced still that there really is a gardener here. So the skeptic says, well, all right, so now we're talking about an invisible gardener, but we still have to be scientific about this. How would we test for, say, an invisible gardener? And so the guy makes a proposal. This turns out to be very well equipped uh, jungle travelers. Uh, suppose they say, well, let's take these uh, thousands of feet of electrical wire that we have with us in this little generator, and what we'll do is we'll rig a trip wire all around this area and run an electric current through it and we'll set it up so that if that uh, the wire is tripped that a little bell or some sort of buzzer will go off and we'll be alerted that uh, somebody has, has tripped the wire. So even if we don't see the guy, nonetheless, uh, he's going to be a being who will trip the wire and we'll be able to t detect and indirectly observe him through uh, his interacting with this trip wire system that we're going to install here. So they agree that they will run that particular experiment and they'll wait for the observational data to come in. So they wait a week, they wait two weeks, they wait a month, and nothing except a few animals that they're able independently to verify trips the trip wire. And so at the end of the month, the skeptic then is saying, see, I told you, there is no gardener. Uh, this garden is just a self-regulating natural set of systems here. And the guy who believes in the gardener hypothesis says, well, that doesn't really prove anything because really it's an immaterial invisible gardener who's attending to it, and that's why uh, the garden is still going the way it is, and we haven't been able to detect the guy. All right, now Flu suggests at this point, as the skeptic would suggest, and as you yourself might be thinking at this point, the guy who's believing in the gardening hypothesis is cheating. Right? He's cheating epistemologically. He's kind of going through the motions of being scientific about this, but he's not really willing to let his hypothesis or his theory, that is to say his belief in the gardener, stand or fall with the observational data. Instead, what he is doing is agreeing, right, or seeming to agree 
that this is a scientific hypothesis, it's a testable hypothesis, that there is an observational possibility that will count against his hypothesis. But when push comes to shove and that observational data comes in and counts against his hypothesis, he just changes his hypothesis in a way to protect the hypothesis from the observational data and actually to make it even harder for there to be such things as observational data. So what we have here is an indication of someone who's not really committed to a scientific way of thinking about things, but rather has a pre-scientific notion that uh, hell or high water, so to speak, he's going to, to stay with. Now what the behaviorist will say is, that when we start thinking about the human psyche, uh, we have to be very careful that we're not doing that same sort of thing, that we really are willing to put our theories about psychology to the observational test. And this is very difficult for many people to do because for many, many centuries we have had this uh, officially intellectual belief in the soul, an officially intellectual belief in the spirit, and in folk psychology, and in popular psychology, and kind of common cultural understanding of what it is to be a human being. We still have this belief in an immaterial spirit or an immaterial soul, and that, so that leads a lot of people to resist the idea of, of, of uh, deeply the soul or the spirit uh, actually being explainable in scientific terms. For example, if we then go back to the 1500s, to the earliest days of science, there was a lot of anatomy work being done on, done. But one of the common theories about the nature of the soul, if you ask, okay, well, where is this soul? Uh, one standard view is to say that the soul resided in the heart, and that kind of makes sense. If we think of the soul as the seat of the passions, uh, the soul is associated with love. Well, we do know when we're in love, right, our, our heart beats faster, and our passions seem to, uh, in many cases, involve a, a heating up in our torso area. And so it's kind of a natural hypothesis to think of the soul as located there. But what some of the early anatomists were discovering was, uh, William Harvey being the most famous of them here, is when we look at the heart, as we did, we find that the heart is a pump. And Harvey was the first, as far as I know, to figure out that the heart was uh, connected to a whole circulatory system. The heart was basically just a pump that pumped uh, uh, blood out to all of the parts of our body, and then it had a collection system, all of the veins, to uh, bring all of the blood back to the heart in an ongoing cycle. Uh, the human heart was uh, essentially the same as the kind of hearts that pigs have in their bodies, that dogs have in their bodies, and you can look at them. And basically, it's just a pump, and when we look, there isn't a soul there. There's no spirit there. Instead, what we've done is we've taken something that was thought to be the seat of the soul, and uh, uh, performed a reduction on it. Uh, it's just a, a materialistic, physicalistic system right at work here. So then the question is, after the 1500s, well, where then is the soul? And slowly the soul kind of migrates up to the head. It's hanging around uh, in the head somewhere. But then, of course, what's going on in, as the sciences develop over the centuries is there's more study of the human nervous system, including the brain. Uh, and then as we go through all the various parts of the brain and figure out what they do, we're not finding a soul in any of them. Or there's no seat of the soul. Instead, what we have is a very complicated physical system. Uh, and we can explain all of the parts of the brain and their functions in terms of physicality. Uh, no need to bring in some sort of immaterial, spooky, spiritual soul. But nonetheless, what we still have in the 20th century is the idea for many people, well, there's kind of got to be a soul somewhere. We're resisting the idea that everything can be explained observationally in terms of purely naturalistic, physical human phenomena. Okay, so the, bi uh, the, the behaviorists, rather, as in their approach, the psychological approach, are very adamant right, about being willing to stick to the observational data. If something can't be observed, if everywhere we look we can't find something, then we have to dismiss it. We're going to explain things only in terms of what is observational data. All right, so now I want to take up the issue of what correlating cause and effect means for a science of psychology. As behaviorists, uh, we're interested in looking at uh, what is observable and only what is observable, uh, only that counts as uh, scientific data. And then we're trying to try to correlate uh, cause and effect relationships among those observational data. So here's what we're trying to explain. Here's a human being, and I've uh, got a slightly oversized head here, because uh, if we're going to do psychology, then clearly the head is important because lots of stuff happens inside that head. What are we trying to explain here as, uh, as, psycho as uh, uh, psychologists, right, so to speak? Well, we know that the human being is part of a broader environment, and we know, roughly speaking, and this is what I'm going to call the standard model, uh, 
of psychology, using the Greek symbol psi for psychology or psychological here. Well, what we're interested in is seeing how, if we have the environment out here, human beings are all part of an environment. We're surrounded by an environment. And the environment impinges right, upon the human being all sorts of stimuli. We have light stimuli, sound stimuli, chemical stimuli that, uh, uh, that come to, through our noses, tactile stimuli, heat stimuli, and so forth. And so we say we have all kinds of then stimuli. from the environment impinging right upon us. Then what happens is inside our heads, we have lots of experiences, psychological experience. We have various kinds of perceptions. Some of those will get stored away in memory. Uh, on the basis of those perceptions and memories, we'll have various kinds of thoughts. We'll have various kinds of feelings and so on, all kicking around inside our head here, so to speak. And then after all of that processing goes on, what then happens is the person then acts in the environment. And so we have action, right? Or the term that the behaviors are especially going to like behavior uh, occurs. And this then is going to be what we can call a response. So it might be the case that out there in the environment, I, uh, there's a certain stimuli, say my coffee cup sitting on the table over there, it impinges upon me. So I have a certain perception there, that evokes in me a certain feeling, right? I now am thirsty and so I have a thought, maybe I'll walk over there, get my coffee cup and have a sip. And so then my behavioral response or my action response will be then to walk over, get my cup of coffee and have a sip. Now, how do we explain that right, as scientists? Well, what we want to do is have, among all of those things that we have observed here, a regularized correlation of the cause and effect. So we can say that the reason why he behaved that way is he had certain thoughts, feelings, and perceptions right inside his head, and those were stimulated by certain kinds of environmental um, uh, conditions. And then predictively, once we've got that worked out, we can do it in a forward direction. We can say, given certain kinds of stimuli, we know that that will lead to certain kinds of thoughts, feelings, perceptions, and so forth. And those thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, and so forth will then cause certain kinds of behaviors. So let's label these things. Suppose we say everything that's going on in the environment in terms of its impinging upon the human being, let's call that A the stimuli from the environment upon the human being. Everything that goes on inside the human head, in the psyche, right, so to speak, we will call that B. And then everything that flows from what goes on in the human psyche outwardly in terms of action or behavior, we will call that C, everything in that category here. Well, what we want to then be able to do is take all of the environmental stimuli that are possible uh, for a human organism and correlate them with all of the things that are going on in B. So we know there are certain colors, there are certain shapes, there are certain kinds of objects, there are certain kinds of actions and properties, all of those things that are going on in the environment that can be stimuli. Those then will be correlated with certain perceptions, thoughts, and feelings inside of the psyche. So one thing we want to do then is to correlate all of the environmental stimuli, that is to say everything in A, with all of the psychological phenomena B. That's all the stuff going on inside the head. Then we also then want to be able to take all of the psychological phenomena and correlate it with people's actions, correlate it with their behaviors, correspond, or correlate it rather with all of the responses right, that they then uh, in turn act upon in the environment. And then uh, that correlation of course is two ways. These things will be uh, causing these sorts of things here or we should be able to, from certain kinds of behaviors, infer backwards what kinds of feelings cause that behavior or what kind of thoughts and so forth. So what we also want to then do is be able to correlate all of the things in B with everything in C. Okay. And if we can do all of that, and we've got uh, a full uh, elaboration of everything that's possible here, everything that's possible here, everything that's possible here, and we know all of the correlations that are possible amongst all of them, that then will be a full and complete science of psychology.
But there's a problem here that the behaviorists will point out, and that has to do with this other issue here of observation. When we're trying to establish these correlations, all of the correlations have to take into account and only be taking into account things that are in principle observable. Science is committed necessarily to correlating observational phenomena. And so what we have here is a big and huge problem. The problem is this. If we look at all of the stuff at A, all of those things are in principle observable from a third person, disinterested objectives, uh, externalized scientific perspective, however we want to characterize it. Uh, all of the stuff that's going on in A is in principle scientifically observable. If we jump over to this side of the equation, the same thing holds. All of this, the actions, all of the behaviors, all of the, the physiological and physical responses that a human organism will engage in, all of those are in principle observable, detectable, measurable, and so forth. But it's different when we turn to B, anything that is going on here. And the problem is that in principle, none of these things is observable scientifically. Right? Uh, I cannot see or observe what you are feeling, what you are thinking, and the same thing holds for you right now. There is no observable scientific method for you to figure out right now what I'm thinking about. Test. You can't do it. Right? Even if you were right here in this room right now, you would not know that I was thinking about my second grade teacher. Uh, uh, I don't remember her name right now, but her face is quite distinctive right at this point here. So that particular memory, I was thinking about that at that point here, that's, that's uh, in principle unobservable to you. So the problem is going to be that everything in B is unobservable. Okay. And this is a big problem, a very big problem, because if we're trying to do a science of psychology, Psychology, it seems like if it's about anything, it's about everything that's going on in B. But if a science has to be about what's observable and everything that's going on in B is not observable, then in principle it's not possible to have a science of psychology. And so the argument that the behaviorists will make against the standard model is that the standard model is dead in the water. The standard model, this way of thinking about uh, the, the approach to uh, the science of psychology is going to make the science of psychology impossible. Well, we might say, okay, well, maybe we can fudge it a little bit here. We can say, all right, maybe uh, everything that's going on in here uh, in B is not observable from a third person perspective. But if we want to get the data, if we want to know what people are perceiving, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're remembering, and so on, we'll just ask them. So then there would then be a question, and I'll put it this way here. Is it then going to be a possible solution? Which would then be just to ask people for first-person reports. You want to know what I'm thinking? Ask me. Right. Write that down in your lab book right, and, uh, and so forth. Now, the behaviorists want to reject this as a possible solution because they'll argue that first-person reports are uh, uh, unscientific, uh, unreliable for a whole variety of reasons. One uh, obvious problem uh, here is that in many cases, if you put it to first person people, what are they, what they're, what they're saying, what they're thinking, they'll simply lie to you. Uh, we also know that lots of people will be embarrassed about various things. If we're you know, trying to get inside their heads and ask what they think, feel, and so forth about important things, well, people get shy, they get embarrassed, and so they're not going to be very forthcoming, and so the data is not going to be very, uh, very accurate. We also know that people are, in many cases, very poor introspectors. Uh, let me get the spelling correctly here. You ask them what, what they're feeling, and uh, they'll say, I don't know, right? And if you put it in terms of stereotypes, this is kind of the standard a uh, complaint that women have about a lot of men, you know, please tell me what you're feeling. And the guy says, I don't know what I'm feeling, right? They just don't have the introspective skills that have developed here. Or if we think about children, we do know that uh, for in many cases, children, uh, it's a very long learning process for them to, uh, to be able to reflect on what's going on inside their psyche, so to speak. I remember uh, knowing one little girl, I think she was about four years old at the point, and uh, I saw this myself, but her parents also told me about it. Uh, she, for the longest time, wasn't able to distinguish between 
uh, having an upset stomach and having her feelings hurt. Because, you know, when you have an upset stomach, you kind of feel yucky in around here. But if someone hurts your feelings, you also kind of feel yucky in around here. And it was very cute what she would say whenever somebody hurt her feelings for, for a little while was, uh, you gave me a stomach ache. Well, it wasn't really a stomach ache. Her feelings were hurt. But nonetheless, she doesn't yet have the introspective vocabulary developed. Of course, she was only four years old, but the point is that lots of people don't ever really develop a very sophisticated uh, introspective vocabulary, and so they're never going to be, from a first-person perspective, a very good source of, of uh, data for us to be scientific here. So for these reasons, the fact that people can lie, that people can be embarrassed and shy and so forth and just uh, poor in, in reporting the basic data, the uh, behaviorists wanted to argue first-person reports are not a possible solution, so we're then back to the problem. In principle, everything that's going on in B is unobservable, but scientific method says that we can only include sci observable observational data in our science, so psychology therefore is dead in the water or not. Here then is what will be the behaviorist solution. If we assume, as the behaviorists do, that the human being is a naturalistic phenomenon, then it follows that the human being as a naturalistic phenomenon is subject to natural cause and effect laws. So we do know that there are law-like causal regularities existing between A and B and between A and C. The problem that we have is that we do not have observational or at least scientifically observational data accessible to us from B. But we do know that there are cause and effect relations between A and B and between A and C. So we do know that everything in A causes everything that goes on in B. And we do know then that everything that goes on in B is what causes everything that goes on in C. And if we look at it this way, then logic should suggest a solution to us. Right? If we know that A causes B and B causes C, then we can cut to the chase and say that A causes C. We know that B is an intermediary, but the middle term here just drops out. We don't have to know what the middle term is in order to establish correlations, law-like regular correlations directly between A and C. And this is good because everything in A is observable, everything in C is observable, and we should then be able to establish the correlations. And so we can still then do the science of psychology without having to attend to that which is in principle unobservable. Now this is uh, what we can sometimes call a black box model. All right, so methodologically what we're going to do now as behaviorists is study the human being, the human psyche, but not uh, uh, make any direct reference to anything that's going on here in B. The assumption is going to be that there are causal relationships between A and B, between A and C, and so we can therefore directly make causal correlations between things going on in A and the behaviors that are going on here in C. Hence, the emphasis for behaviorism is going to be on the behaviorism, hence the name of it, uh, rather than referring to various sorts of internalistic or subjectivistic types of states that might be going on inside the human mind. So as I suggested a moment ago, we're going to uh, see everything that's going on here in terms of it being a black box. And a black box is, by definition, something that you, it's, it's, there's something inside that box but uh, you can't see what's inside it. So what I want you to imagine uh, uh, here is uh, a, an experimental setup where, suppose from the ceiling, I have a huge sheet uh, suspended, but I've got it suspended fairly close to the floor, and so when you look down upon it, you can't see what's underneath it. And the rules of the game are that you can't uh, kneel down on the floor and try to look under it as well. So from a top view, what we have then is, say, a giant square, apparatus suspended, say, by some guy wires right directly up from the ceiling, and we only get to look at it right from the, from the top here. So that's our black box, right, so to speak. Uh, but you can do various kinds of uh, experiments upon it, and suppose uh, what we can do is take a, a ping pong balls, and suppose I've got a big bag of ping pong balls available, and these will be orange ping pong balls. So suppose you have a ping pong ball, and we position it on the floor over here, and what we do then is we roll it under 
the black box. So we just shoot it under the black box from that particular direction. And suppose that one uh, comes out over here. Okay. Now we'll designate this by a number. This is ping pong ball number one, and this is ping pong ball number one coming out here. This is uh, our black box. This is the input, right, so to speak. Right, this is our input data. We measure the, bar, uh, the ball started here, it went in that particular direction. This is the, by analog, analogy rather, the stimulus right, uh, on the system here. Over here, we have our output. Right, this is our response. You uh, stimulate the back bo black box by shooting a ping pong ball in this way. The response is a ping pong ball comes out here. Okay, so we make a note of that. So as then we come down here, we take another ping pong ball, we'll call that number two, and we shoot that one in right, right at that point here. Uh, suppose this one uh, bounces out right over here in that particular direction. Okay. Weird. What's under there? So, we come over here, take another ping pong ball, this will be number three. So as we get tricky at this point here, we shoot this one at this particular angle, and uh, it, uh, say, comes out over here. And we continue to do this. We do this with 100 ping pong balls, we do it with 1,000 ping pong balls, we do it with 10,000 ping pong balls. Question then will be, if we've done all of this, and we keep very careful records, if by the time we get to this particular ping pong ball, this is then going to be ping pong ball number 10,001. And I tell you, take that ping pong ball and shoot it in this particular direction under the black box. Should you be able to, do you have a great deal of uh, confidence that you would be able to predict after uh, 10,000 iterations of this experiment before, where ping pong ball number 10,001 is going to come out. And chances are good that you will say, yes, I should be able to predict with a high degree of accuracy where ping pong ball number 10,001 is going to come out. Uh, I've got, uh, on the basis of the pre previous 10,000 experiments right, that we've run, a lot of correlations between inputs and outputs or between stimuluses and responses. And so I've got a very good data set that even though I have not seen and not ever observe what is under this box, I know what this ping pong ball is going to do, how it's going to behave, right, so to speak, and I can predict the behavior of subsequent ping pong balls with a high degree of accuracy, uh, even though this is in principle unobservable to me. So the argument then by analogy that the uh, behaviorists are going to do is to say that what we can then do is just treat the human psyche as a black box for scientific purposes. We don't need to get hung up on trying to figure out when someone's lying to us, when they're not lying to us, uh, trying to filter through all of the biases and distortions in first person data. We can be ruthlessly third person, we can be ruthlessly uh, uh, objective, we can be ruthlessly scientific and public in our observations. Uh, here are all of the ping pong balls, so to speak, impinging upon us, and here are all of the ping pong ball behaviors that are going on out here. We can come up with, over time, after lots and lots of observations, lots and lots of, uh, of correlations, ironclad, or very near to it, ironclad predictions based on what kind of stimuli we have, what kind of behaviors we're going to get, and then working backwards, if we get certain kinds of behaviors, we can tell what kinds of stimuli necessarily gave rise to that. Okay, that's the methodology, that's the behaviorist technique applied to, uh, to human psyche. Now that's a methodological issue here, right, that we're going to apply this back black box methodology. One other assumption that we should uh, point out or highlight uh, has been uh, at least implicit uh, throughout the presentation so far, and that is that in the relationships between A and B and between A and C, there is a regularized, causal, necessary set of correlations, right, going on in their behaviors. That is to say that there is a deterministic system, right, at work here, and this certainly is an important part of the behaviorist package here. The behaviors are environmental determinists, that all of the behaviors that are resulting here ultimately are conditioned by stimuli that started in the environment, and so there's no magic, right, that goes on in here from their perspective. There are no uh, uh, monkeys throwing wrenches, right, in the works, right, up at this point here. Given certain kinds of stimuli, it's not possible for whatever it is that's going on here at B, 
to deviate from certain kinds of scripts, and so necessarily there are going to be certain kinds of CE behaviors here. And so this thesis then of environmental determinism is very important to the behaviorists. Uh, if there is any such thing as freedom, volition, uh, self-regulation, uh, uh, any degree of autonomy from a stimuli, uh, then this model is not going to work. And so the environmental determinism is an important part of the, uh, the behaviorist apparatus here. And this, of course, is one of the things that, uh, that leads people to resist behaviorism. They will argue that human beings are creatures that uh, have their own thoughts, that do have free will, do have volition, and so on. What the behaviorists argue is that that is an illusion. They won't deny that we have the experience of free will, but they will argue that free will is not a genuine phenomenon. Instead, everything is deterministic, and then we'll then trot us through any number of examples to try to, to prove this to us. If you look just, for example, a simple example at how I am dressed. All right, I am wearing standard right, Western male dress of the, uh, the 21st century, right, casual professional dress. Why am I wearing these particular clothes? I could say, well, I made my own autonomous free will types of choices, but the behaviorists will uh, point out that really I didn't, being a person who uh, was born in the late 20th century and who's now existing in the early part of the 20th century. I was born into a certain culture, into a certain kind of social environment, and in that uh, environment I was taught, right, or conditioned that males who are doing certain sorts of things wear these kinds of clothes, and women or females wear these kinds of clothes, and under these circumstances this is the appropriate kind of dress, right, and so on. And so I have been conditioned to wear something like this, something or other like this, the exact uh, uh, kind of thing that I would be wearing. There might be some variability here. But they would point out that it would be impossible for me, and in fact, it is impossible for me uh, ever under a circumstance like this to show up uh, wearing a little black dress, right, such that a woman might wear if she was going out on a, on a dinner date, right, or something like that. I have been conditioned such that that uh, kind of attire is not possible to me. But the behaviorists would point out, if I had been raised in a different culture or under different social circumstances and then at the right formative times, I could have been taught that uh, you know, wearing a little back dress is appropriate and then I would be entirely comfortable right, with doing so. So the kinds of dress, for example, that we, that we wear uh, is culturally conditioned, right? it's environmentally conditioned. The language right, that we speak. We're all born into a linguistic culture, and we're bombarded with certain linguistic uh, behaviors by other people. Those serve as stimuli on us. They condition us uh, to, to respond and behave linguistically right, in certain ways. So I speak English, North American English, Middle North American English with the particular accent that I have as a result of cultural conditioning. All right, so those are, are things that uh, uh, might seem like we have lots of choices about, but the environmental determinists will say that we don't really. Uh, take things that maybe seem fairly biological, like just nutritional choices, putting food in the system. The behaviorists will point out that uh, our food preferences are culturally conditioned. Uh, right, I eat certain kinds of foods because those are the kinds of foods my parents fed to me, and so I develop certain kinds of preferences, I develop certain kinds of aversions, and my preferences and aversions could have been entirely different if I had been raised in a, a different uh, part of the world or at a different time. I always think at this moment of uh, the second Indiana Jones, I think it was the Temple of Doom, Doom rather, movie where Indiana, uh, Indy is the honored guest of some tribe in Africa, and uh, they're all very uh, happy to have him there, they're putting on a meal of celebration, uh, in his honor, and all of the, the natives there are very excited about this special dish that, that, that we're going to have, and so everybody is anticipating what's it going to be. And finally, it's revealed to us that the special dish is going to be fresh monkey brains. And you know, I remember distinctly, right at that point in the movie, the gorge rising in my throat, the thought of my eating fresh monkey brains was repulsive to me. Certainly that was the reaction of the character Indiana Jones right at the time. But why are we having that uh, seemingly visceral biological reaction in this particular case? Well, it's not an innate uh, uh, visceral reaction. It's something that's culturally conditioned. It's not something that we're making a choice about. Uh, and the proof of it would be if uh, I or Indiana Jones had been raised in that tribe, then my food preferences would be very different. And like the other natives, I would have been dancing around with anticipation, uh, saying, oh great, fresh monkey brains, right, for supper. But it's environmentally conditioned. All right, so food preferences, our choices in dress, uh, the languages that we speak, even things that seem more personal choice uh, and variability 
uh, like say religions, right, or political preferences, the environmental determinists can explain in terms of cultural conditioning factors. Here's a, a thought experiment that you uh, you can't commit uh, or, or, or actually engage in because of uh, grave moral objections to it. But suppose you went to the maternity ward of, uh, of a local hospital and stole 100 babies. Uh, you can understand the, the moral objections here. But suppose you did this as a thought experiment. You take those 100 babies and you ship them off to, uh, say, you place them with uh, devout Islamic families in Saudi Arabia. Fast forward 20 years, what is the religion of those 100 babies whom you've placed with adoption, uh, for adoption there? If you had taken those same 100 babies and placed them with Baptist families in Tennessee, fast forward 20 years, what would their religion be? If you'd taken those same babies and placed them with Hindu families in India or animist religious families in uh, some part of Africa, uh, what you would find again is 99 point whatever percent of those uh, children would grow up to have the religion of the culture in which they are raised. So we all might think that we're making our own religious choices, but really it's simply a matter of, or not necessarily simply, or complexly a matter of certain kinds of uh, cultural conditioning acting upon us. And whatever the strongest uh, and most effective stimuli upon us, that is what leads us to believe, right, uh, whatever it is we believe in religion and then to engage in the responses. That is to say, the religious rituals and practices and saying the certain things that we do. So, environmental determinism, the behaviorists will argue, is true. Uh, the human being is a stimulus response system. We do have this problem of uh, trying to get observational access to what's going on in B, but methodologically that problem is solvable by using the black box model. And so the science of psychology, we recast it as a behavioral uh, system. What we're interested in is behaviors predicting people's behaviors and then uh, when necessary controlling their behaviors by controlling the stimuli to which they are exposed particularly when they are younger the science of psychology can exist and it can then also be a practically useful uh, uh, science uh, in, in our case we'll turn to the educational implications uh, and now see how the uh, the science of psychology will dictate certain kinds of educational practices all right, now in the uh, next subunit, we're going to turn to behaviorism's implications for education. I want to make just a few points here. First big point, though, I want to make, though, is that unlike the other isms we're looking at, there is no specific curriculum that falls out of behaviorism. Uh, behaviorism, uh, in terms of its theory of psychology, sees itself as controlling the inputs in order to get the desired outputs, right? Or another way to put it is to say, the job is uh, uh, of the, the behaviorist to set up the environmental stimuli in such a way as to get the desired behavioral responses. The question of what the desired behavioral responses are or what those should be, those are not questions that are scientific questions, and so they're not ones that behaviorists as scientists uh, are, are prepared to answer. They will uh, build themselves as technicians, right, or as engineers uh, when they turn to education, uh, uh, as consultants, right, or as people taking the best results of the science of psychology, behaviorism, right, as a science, and then applying it in an engineering fashion or as a t in a technician fashion to the project of, uh, of uh, molding human beings, right, in the appropriate kinds of ways. So by analogy, uh, if we think of the practice of training a dog, uh, a pe person who sets himself up or herself up as an expert dog trainer, that person is not going to dictate to you or tell you what kind of dog you should want or what kind of dog behaviors are the right kind of behaviors. You might want, uh, you've just got a puppy, you might want that dog to be a family companion kind of dog or you might uh, want your dog to be a guard dog or a hunting dog, or you might have uh, be blind and you want to have a seeing eye guide kind of dog. Uh, there's nothing in behaviorism that says what the right kind of dog is. Instead, if you take your dog to an expert dog trainer, the dog trainer should be able to say, if that is the kind of dog that you want, you tell me 
I will train the dog. I will uh, arrange the, uh, the, the stimuli and the environment in which the dog is trained so that the dog behaves as the hunting dog or as the family companion dog, right, or whatever it is. Or if you are going to be uh, the dog trainer yourself, uh, I will teach you the techniques that you then will put into place to get the dog to behave in the way that you uh, think is appropriate. Now we draw that analogy to, to human beings. What kind of human beings uh, should we have? What, uh, what is the meaning of life? What, what are the right kind of human behaviors? Uh, what kind of society are we preparing uh, students to, to enter into? None of those questions are questions that the science of psychology answers. So it's not going to be something that the, the, the behaviorists as educational practitioners are going to answer. They're not going to dictate a specific, specific rather curriculum. Rather, the behaviorist will come in once the curriculum is decided, once the school board or the school or the particular teacher or parent says, this is uh, my, my, my set of desired behaviors or my set of desired outcomes. This is what I want my child or my children to become. The behaviorist will provide the specific techniques drawing on behavioral science to achieve those particular ends. All right, we now want to turn to some of the educational implications for uh, behaviorism as a theory of, of psychology. And one of the uh, important implications is that the behaviorists will say in, a, in, a, in accordance with their systematically, uh, one might even say ruthless uh, scientific approach to the science of psychology, that educators should see themselves as ruthlessly applied science, scientists rather. Uh, that if we understand the human being as a conditioned stimulus response machine, then education is a matter of uh, programming or conditioning the right kinds of behavioral responses in students. Students come in as unconditioned or lightly conditioned. Uh, obviously, they've had a few years of conditioning at home. Our jobs then is to build on that conditioning or necessarily to recondition in some particular respects to get the desired behavioral outputs that we want by the end of the educational process. And so uh, as a start, what I want to do is uh, establish a grid here of behavioral techniques that uh, a behavioral psychologist, as applied to education, will, uh, will urge upon teachers to make uh, as part of their professional training uh, and as part of their ongoing professional development to uh, elaborate kinds of techniques that behavioral science can provide to them uh, to apply to educational practice. Now, if we are uh, thinking about the kinds of stimuli that we as teachers are in charge of, we're going to bring students into a classroom. The classroom will have all kinds of stimuli uh, that the students then will be exposed to. We as the teachers will be stimulating and providing all sorts of stimuli to the students. We will say certain things to them. We will uh, engage them behaviorally. They will be observing how we ourselves are behaving, and that will be a kind of stimulus. We'll provide all sorts of educational materials and so forth to them. All of those stimuli, all of those stimuli, we as scientifically minded educators should think through systematically and scientifically and use those ones that we know and have tested uh, uh, we'll, uh, so, such that they will uh, re achieve the desired results, whatever those results we have decided they are going to be. Now, as a, as a way of uh, elaborating the kinds of stimuli that are possible here, there are a few different ways of, uh, uh, of setting up a taxonomical chart here, but I'm going to give you one simple, simplified uh, chart in this particular case here. What we can do by way of stimuli is uh, give. Right, a certain kind of stimuli, or we can take right, a certain kind of stimuli. So it can be, for example, that uh, I uh, will, if a student does a certain kind of thing, uh, say something to the student. I might, uh, if a student does something that I think is an appropriate behavior, I might give the student praise. Right? The other thing that I might do, uh, by contrast, is take away right, something. There might be a stimulus that is present, and I can then remove that stimulus right, from the environment. So for example, it might be the case that uh, recess is a normal part of the student's uh, day, uh, but if the student's behavior has not been the kind of behavior that we judge to be appropriate, then I might take away recess. Right? So I can give a stimulus, right, or I can take away a stimulus. We can take the stimuli and also uh, array them in terms of positive stimulus right, or a 
negative stimulus. So for example, uh, a student might do a behavior that I think is a, an appropriate behavior, and then the stimulus, uh, the, the reinforcing stimulus that I might give is to say, give the student a gold star on, on the work that uh, he or she has done. Right? Or it might be the case that the student has engaged in a behavior that I think is an inappropriate behavior, and so the stimulus that I give to that student is a negative. I might frown at the student, right? Or uh, in extreme cases, I might slap the student and so forth. That uh, uh, would be uh, giving something that is a, a negative. All right, now with this kind of uh, two-dimensional array here, what we can do is, as educators, think about possible kinds of stimuli or the removal of stimuli that would fit in each category here. So, to give a positive, for example, an example might be praise. I might say, good job. I might, on the student's work, give them a gold star. Right? Or if the student uh, does good work, I might give them a grade that uh, is, a, is a positive grade, like an A or, or, or a B. Uh, by contrast, we might then give negatives. Here, um, uh, a frown might be a, an example here. More strongly, it might be to uh, give the student some blame, right, where verbally I um, <clears throat> uh, say something that, that is negative, bad work, or you shouldn't have done that, right, and so forth. Or uh, I might also give a negative, I might give a, a failing grade. I might give the student right, an F on, on, a, uh, on a report or, or a project. And then the same holds if we go turn over to the uh, take side of the equation here. I did give the example earlier of taking away a positive. Uh, if a student, for example, is engaged in what I judge to be inappropriate behaviors, then I might take away recess, right? And so as, as a punishment, so to speak, the student has to stay inside, for example. Uh, another example might be, uh, suppose uh, we have a younger, younger students, and every time they go for recess, they line up. One student gets to be the line leader, and so today, so-and-so's day to be the line leader, but so-and-so was uh, misbehaving today, and so I've taken away the, the, the person's privilege of being the line leader, and I, I give that to someone else. So the uh, privilege might be uh, taken away. Another example is, uh, I think, a modern example. It could probably be in a couple of places here, but uh, the phenomenon of a time out, right? So you have a student who is misbehaving or not staying on task and what you do is you you make the student go away from the the educational environment and sit quietly by himself and uh, hopefully contemplate things and the idea here is at least the, the theory behind timeout is that if the student really thinks about it he knows that he wants to be learning stuff and he wants to be in classroom for various sorts of reasons uh, and the timeout then gives him time to uh, reflect on the situation, get his behaviors under control, and then recommit to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to joining the class and behaving appropriately. So by putting the person in timeout, what you're doing is you are taking away a positive. Uh, you could, of course, also characterize this one as giving the student a negative. Um, cause because uh, if you put the student in timeout, then typically what happens is the student gets bored, and the, the boredom is a, a negative, it's a painful state or a psychologically uncomfortable state, and hopefully that then spurs the person's a renewed commitment to the appropriate kinds of uh, behaviors. All right, examples of taking uh, away a negative. This is a little bit harder uh, to, to, uh, to, to assume, but I think by contrast, to some examples that obviously we can't do with, uh, with human children, again, for grave moral reasons here. But there are experiments that have been done with rats, uh, uh, that if you put the rats in a maze, and of course behaviorists are, are all about putting rats in a maze and, uh, and teaching them to, to run through the maze effectively. Uh, if you give a positive, uh, the example would be, you know, you have a piece of cheese at the end of the maze, and then this, the sooner the rat learns to uh, get through the maze, the rat gets the reward. So the, 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 the positive piece of cheese here. You can in, re, uh, invert that by uh, one experiment I remember reading about, making the whole floor of the, the maze be an electrified sheet of metal, and then you've got the maze imposed upon that. 
So as soon as you put the rat on or into the maze, uh, the rat is experiencing electrical shots, shocks and so is experiencing pain and discomfort. And then uh, the sooner the rat figures out how to get to the maze, when he, when he gets out of it, he's into the safe zone, he's no longer electri electrified. And so the reward, so to speak, is the removal of or the taking away of a negative here. So uh, it might then be a matter of right, removing some sort of pain. Right? And we do know that uh, this is an operative cir circumstance under some uh, s uh, educational models where the, the normal circumstance of the schooling situation is that the students don't want to be there, they are uncomfortable, but as a reward, what we might do if they behave appropriately is take away something from them that they take to be a negative. So we might, uh, uh, for example, say uh, getting recess uh, is removal of a painful state. You're getting out of the, the uncomfortable situation of being in school, and you get to go out and enjoy yourself in recess. So recess could also be down here if one characterizes it from that particular context. Some teachers right, or professors, I'm not a big fan of this model myself here, but they will do something similar in the case of exams. What they will say is you know, taking tests, doing assignments, exams, right, and so forth. All of that is painful. Students don't want to engage in it. So what they will have is a policy of if you do well on all of your assignments and tests up until the final exam, then you don't have to undergo the, uh, the, the ordeal of the final exam. So then again, what you're doing is taking away a negative here. So you uh, eliminate exams based on prior uh, positive performance. Okay, now the idea of this, and this is just the beginning, uh, is that what we should be doing as education professionals, particularly education professionals who are informed by behaviorism, is working out a taxonomy, right? Something like this. And in each of the cells, right, of the taxonomy, we should have a whole number, right, of, uh, of items, a whole repertoire of items that we know uh, fit into that particular category. So we have a whole toolkit. Uh, a very full toolkit, and that what we have also done is we independently have experimented with these sorts of things. We're keeping up with the literature where other teachers are reporting on their experiments with these things. Uh, educational psychologists who are behaviorists are experimenting with various kinds of, uh, of, of packages here. Uh, and so we're constantly incorporating uh, new elements into each parts of these grids. And then we also have a fairly uh, worked out uh, uh, schedule so that we know if it's this kind of circumstance, I'm going to give praise. But then I'm going to give praise three times running, but then not praise for the next little time. I might switch to gold stars, or I might switch to grades, or I might work in various combinations over here. Uh, there are diminishing returns to the repeated uses of any of these particular things. So I've got, uh, for my first graders, a worked out repertoire. I've got, for my second graders, a worked out repertoire. And I'm constantly tweaking it and incorporating and adapting and so forth as my profession goes on. Uh, that is scientific. Here are all of the stimuli, and I'm keeping records of what kinds of behaviors uh, they are leading to, uh, which ones they're reinforcing, which ones they're not really reinforcing very well. Uh, and so, uh, as a result of my scientific record keeping, I am evolving uh, to be a better teacher at generating the right kind of overall stimuli to which the students are exposed, so that by the end of the educational process, they come out behaving the way the educational process says they should be behaving. All right, as we've seen in that uh, two by two grid that we just talked to, uh, behaviorists are very strong on the idea of having a repertoire of techniques, a repertoire of uh, stimuli uh, uh, that the teacher uh, has ready to go that are age appropriate, uh, and a particular recipe that uh, can be subject to modification to meet the, the needs of particular circumstances uh, as, as they arise. But this is something that should be part of the teacher's ongoing professional training, keeping up with what the behaviorist scientists working in the labs are continuing to learn about what kind of uh, environmental stimuli work to achieve uh, particular kinds of, of behaviors. Now, uh, human beings, of course, are very complex, but there is nonetheless a large body of uh, literature uh, and experimental results that behaviorists have worked on over the course of decades, in most cases starting with animals that are less complicated than human beings, many experiments on 
pigeons, on rats, on dogs, um, and so forth. And there are a number of things that uh, work consistently uh, for all of those species, and uh, we do know by extrapolation and by uh, some experimentation with human beings that they do work with human beings as well. And so the teacher should continue to be open to the latest results as they're coming from uh, behavioral science. Now, just to uh, highlight a few things that the behavioral scientists uh, say work, and they work very well, both on animals and, uh, and the human animal. There not being any, in principle, distinction between human animals and the other kinds of animals. One thing that works is repetition. Uh, and so what we should have built into the stimuli is a structured repetitiveness uh, uh, so that the students are exposed to the same stimuli under the same circumstances and then over time they are conditioned to get the, the, the right kind of behavioral response. Re repetition then has, a, has the effect long term of conditioning and, and making that conditioning stick for the, for the longer term. And so there should be a great deal of drill uh, and, a, and a great deal of, uh, of consistency in the, in the lesson, so to speak. Another thing that, that, that works is uh, the practice of immediate feedback or fairly quickly uh, getting feedback to the students uh, based on whatever it is that they are, they are doing. Uh, one thing that the experimental results show is that if there is a, a longer span of time and the longer the span of time between the student exhibiting the behavior and that behavior being reinforced or not reinforced, uh, the slower the process of getting the right kind of conditioned behavior results. So what we therefore need to do is get away from what is the fairly standard practice in many uh, schools and colleges of students taking a test and maybe the teacher gets around to grading the test by the following week and getting it back to the students. Uh, the results typically show that if, uh, if it's not back within a day or in particular in the younger grades within an hour or so, uh, the students are not in a position to coordinate or make a connection between the, uh, the tests that they took and the results that they're getting a week or two weeks or however later. Now, what this then follows, if we are interested in both of those things, repetition and quick uh, feedback, is that the behaviorists were among the earliest to be very uh, gung-ho and great advocates for the introduction of technology and the introduction of machines, educational machines because machines, as we know, uh, they don't get tired, they don't get bored the way teachers do. Machines will give the same repetitive feedback on a fairly regular basis. Machines also can be very quick. If we have individualized machines, for example, uh, the machines can give students feedback individually very quickly right on the spot. It's not a matter of the, the, the teacher rather has to grade 30 tests whenever she has time uh, and get those 30 uh, student, uh, 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 tests back to the students uh, at some point in the future. So the behaviorists were among the first to then start developing uh, uh, mechanical machines and then certainly as uh, by the time we got to the middle part of the 20th century and later the introduction of uh, computers into classrooms and the development of software uh, that then is very repetitive, can be uh, structured, can uh, in increase uh, the complexity at the student's own pace and then uh, uh, immediately be giving the students the needed feedback that they, they need. Uh, and so the students uh, uh, also then can be getting all sorts of other kinds of feedback. Uh, another thing that the experimental results show, particularly in the case of humans, is that uh, the human memory seems to be uh, attuned to uh, music, right, for example. If, for example, I, I give you the assignment of memorizing a poem, well, that can be very difficult, very tedious, and accuracy rates are often very, very difficult. I know in my own case, it can be difficult for me to, uh, to, to memorize a poem, even though I do like poetry very much. But if we do notice uh, the, the introduction of music, that students and just about every human being seems to be able to pick up lyrics very easily. So if you take a piece of poetry or a set of words and you set it to music, music then the behaviors come out very quickly. Uh, uh, if we just say, here are 26 abstract symbols, we want to you to memorize them in a particular order. A, then B, then C, then D. Well, that's very difficult to do, but you put that to a piece of music, the ABC song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right, and so forth. Two-year-olds can pick it up, three-year-olds can pick it up, and they can learn that abstract uh, set of symbols very simply. 
And so the behaviorists were also among the first to uh, be strong advocates for particularly drill things, uh, particularly things that are, 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 are mechanical, verbal things that we want students to be able to pick up and have at their fingertips, so to speak, like uh, um, the ABC song, put things to music that makes things uh, uh, learn very, uh, learn much more quickly, and then you get the right kinds of responses. So. If we think of, uh, for example, the uh, conjunction-junction uh, type of song, if we want the students to learn a long list of conjunctions uh, in grammar class, well, of course, we can just memorize the list, but if we set it to a, to, a, to, a, to a piece of music, they pick it up very quickly. Or an example that resonates for me from my childhood, the McDonald's Corporation, uh, where the thing had a very clever advertisement back in the 70s and 80s uh, that was just a list of all of the ingredients in the Big Mac. Now, if you just have a list of all of the ingredients in the Big Mac, that's very tedious and uh, it's hard to memorize. But you put it to a catchy jingle, uh, and then suddenly millions and millions of people around the world know the ingredients of the Big Mac, and they are, are singing the song fairly quickly. Another thing uh, behaviorists are, are uh, 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 big on uh, and have made this suggestion has to do with changing the, the nature of the school year based on the results of experimental psychology. For various accidents of history, what we have is a practice of having students start school, say, at the beginning of September and then running through until, say, the beginning of June and then taking a couple of months off and then picking up the school year again the following September. Well, what teachers have noticed, of course, over the years is that by the time students come back at the beginning of September, they've learned, lost, rather, or, or forgotten huge swaths of what they formerly were fairly proficient at at the, at the end of the, the, the previous school year. And so that two-month chunk of time when there is no school then seems to be too long for the appropriate kinds of retention. So if we're genuinely interested in education and if the psychological results show that human retention uh, requires regular reinforcement and that there can only be certain uh, specified chunks of time before the retention rates drop off significantly. Uh, if we're genuinely committed to education, what we should then be uh, committed to do is uh, changing the structure of the school year. Instead of having, having one big 10-month uh, chunk of time and then taking two months off, perhaps what we should do is go to a quarter system where the students, uh, say, are in school for 10 weeks and then we take a week off and then another 10 weeks and then a week off or something like that. But the idea here is that we should be open to the experimental evidence and we should be, uh, as, as individual teachers and as school systems, be willing uh, in an ongoing fashion to modify our delivery vehicles, including our, our, our institutional vehicles, to fit with the latest results coming out of behavioral experimental science. The right, final major topic, a subtopic I want to talk about in the uh, context of behaviorism education is this issue of control, uh, this issue of uh, being a conditioner. And this is one of the things that, uh, in the context particularly of 20th and 21st century uh, American education, really gets people's hackles up. And it's one of the things that the, the behaviorists say we have to make no bones about. Our job as educators is to control the stimuli uh, in order to get the desired behaviors. Our job as educators is not to teach students to explore their value preferences. Our job is not to motivate students to become self-learners. Our job is not to let the student's inner child or inner preferences work their way out and piggyback on them in order to facilitate the student's uh, self-expression and, uh, and self-development. All of that, the behaviorists argue, is based on a faulty view of human nature and simply sets ourselves up for ineffective education. And certainly one of the major criticisms that the behaviorists mount about 20th century and 21st century education is that it's uh, completely ineffective or largely ineffective. We're not generating the kinds of students who uh, know what they need to know and are able to do what they're supposed to be able to do. And the behaviorist argument is that we have incorporated into the educational system faulty views of what uh, the human being is. Uh, and so we have uh, incorporated faulty views of what education should be all about. Now, I have a quotation here from uh, John Watson, one of the early founders of the behavioral approach that I think is, uh, is important here uh, uh, in, 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 its, in its fundamental consistency uh, in terms of behavioral application. So here's the quotation here. 
Psychology, as the behaviorist views it, is a purely objective, experimental branch of natural science. Its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behavior. Introspection forms no essential part of its method, nor is the scientific value of its de data dependent upon the readiness with which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. The behaviorist recognizes no dividing line between man and brute. On that latter point, we think of the dog training analogy here again. Uh, we're not primarily interested if we're dog trainers in what the dog wants, what the dog feels, what are the dog's goals in life. Uh, you know, the inner dog uh, and letting the dog be all that the dog can be. We have specific behavioral outcomes that we want to train the dog in terms of, uh, and that is, that's our objective. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are objective, we are scientific, we are engineers, we are technicians. The human being is simply a more complicated uh, case, right, uh, 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 of an animal that is subject to objective conditioning. And so we are conditioners, we are technicians, we are engineers, end of the story. Uh, our job is to control the environment, to eliminate all of the haphazard stimuli, all of the uncontrollable stimuli, all of the erratic stimuli, to control entirely the, uh, the environment so the students are exposed to the right conditions at the right time and the right intensity so as to get the desired behavioral outcomes. Uh, and uh, that is our job. That is our, so our professional obligation right, as, ed uh, as educators. And we should uh, ruthlessly eliminate any res resistance we feel within ourselves as educators uh, toward achieving those ends. But of course, uh, much of uh, contemporary education and many of the other philosophies of education do build into themselves exactly such resistance. And one of the standard resistances is that, well, you know, behaviorism really sounds so dictatorial. It sounds so controlling. It sounds so, so authoritarian. And particularly in the, in the American context, it sounds so uh, un-American, right? We're, we're, uh, we're about freedom. We're about the inner dignity of all human beings. And so uh, education that builds itself as authoritarian and controlling certainly goes against the grain here. Uh, I got a quotation here from, uh, from B.F. Skinner from his book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, right? As the title suggests, we need to get beyond these prejudices about freedom and about dignity here. Quote, defenders of freedom and dignity want to escape from the charge that they are controlling people. Uh, unquote. And to the extent that we think that it's a bad thing to be controlling people, that that's a charge, then that sets us up for a resistance to try to soften the message. But from the behaviorist perspective, to the extent that we soften the message, that we're just setting ourselves up for soft education, that is to say, ineffective education. But the point the behaviorists uh, will insist upon here, falling out of their view of human nature, is students are controlled. Students are going to be conditioned by their environment. That's the nature of a human being. We are tabula rasa. We are plastic. We are born into an environment. And depending on what the prevailing uh, environmental stimuli are, what the strongest uh, uh, conditioners we are exposed to, those are the things that are going to dictate the kinds of behaviors that are reinforced and so dictate what kinds of human agents we are going to turn out to be. So students are going to be conditioned. And so as educators, uh, the choice we either have is we are going to take charge of the conditioning or we're just going to leave it to random and haphazard conditioning, whatever conditioning the students are exposed to outside of school or whatever uh, 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 uncontrolled conditions they're exposed to inside of school. But those latter choices are simply to abdicate our responsibility as educators. Students are going to be conditioned. Our professional job is to control the conditioning, uh, control the stimuli so as to achieve the, the desired results. Now a second kind of resistance here that uh, Skinner uh, also emphasizes is that uh, education is difficult. There's no question about that. Human beings are, are, are complicated uh, animal. And so one kind of get out of jail free card that uh, uh, often feeds into the teacher's interest is a desire not to be held fully accountable for the results of education. And so the idea that in some sense humans have this biological nature that is going to uh, out uh, no matter what we do. 
or that students are coming into the school system already preconditioned by their parents or by the neighborhoods that they're grown, uh, they've grown up in, or that students have their own choices and minds of their own, and so that leads them, uh, leads them rather to, uh, to, to not be amenable. You know, we can't control students uh, uh, and, and override the free choices that they are making. And so uh, we're off the hook, right, as teachers. We're, we're not responsible for the, uh, the end result of the educational process. I have a quotation for here from B.F. Skinner's Beyond Freedom and Dignity, where he has no truck with uh, quotation or with uh, that sort of uh, attitude. Quote, an important advantage right, to, uh, to the, the, the non-behaviorist approach, Skinner is saying, an important advantage is that the practitioner avoids responsibility, just as it is not the midwife's fault uh, if the baby is still born or deformed, so the teacher is exonerated when the teacher failures. And the behaviorist response, that's the end of the quotation there, is, uh, is we're like a dog trainer. Uh, we can, of course, say that dogs have a certain biological nature, but if we are expert dog trainers, we should be able to control the conditions to uh, recondition the dog to, to whatever it is that we want to, to, to be so. There are no bad dogs, right, so to speak, as one famous dog trainer, trainer puts it. If we don't think we're up to the task uh, of, of taking dogs, uh, uh, unformed puppy dogs or dogs that have already been perhaps mistrained, uh, and, and reconditioning them into the right kind of dogs, well then we shouldn't set ourselves up as dog trainers. And the same thing then holds for human trainers. If, uh, if we do not think that we as teachers are up to the task of taking five-year-olds into the school system uh, uh, and, and, and training them into what we want them to be as adults, if we say, oh well, they're already conduct, con corrupted or conditioned by their parents, or there are too many other uh, environmental stimuli that they're exposed to outside of the school, if we think that's too hard a job for us as educators, as teachers, well, then we should not set ourselves up as teachers. We should go into another line of work that is simpler. Only individuals who think they are up to the task, only those individuals who are committed to the task of taking the best results of behavioral science and crafting an engineering system, a conditioning system within the school system to get the desired results. However imperfectly uh, behavioral science is, uh, uh, or how much ever imperfect uh, we've, uh, progress we have made so far, if nonetheless we're not committed to that project, if we're always going to be falling back on excuses, uh, falling back on excuses is not acceptable, we should, uh, if we're not committed, then we should find some other line of work. It's ultimately like the coach of a soccer team, for example. Uh, we hold the coaches of soccer teams accountable just as we hold dog trainers accountable, right, and so forth. A coach can come in, and, and certainly coaching any sort of a team and a soccer team is, is a difficult project. Uh, and if uh, consistently a coach over the course of a whole season or two seasons or three seasons is only getting middling results or the soccer team is consistently losing, then we say, look, this coach is just not up to the task. It's time for that coach to move on, perhaps to go into another line of work. It's time to bring in a coach with a better set of conditioning techniques for the soccer team. Only those coaches that show themselves as being able to take the raw material of the players to come in, to, uh, to condition them in certain ways, to train them to behave as in certain ways together on the field, and to successfully to get the desired results, those are the coaches we want to, uh, to consistently to be, uh, to, be, to be our soccer coaches. And so the same standards should uh, hold when we're talking more significantly about something that is more important to most parents uh, and should be most more, more important than uh, simply a sporting team, that is to say a child's life. If we have teachers in place who are consistently not uh, generating students who are conditioned in the right behaviors or they're only achieving middling results, then either of those teachers have to go or the administrators who are in charge of the, uh, the institutional structure, they have to go and we need to bring in a new crop of teachers and a new crop of administrators who uh, can achieve the desired results here. So to put a little more positive spin on this and not to be talking too much about firing people, our goal, the one that we should be embracing is to exert effective control. Students are going to be controlled. They are going to be conditioned. We're interested in as behaviorists in effective conditioning. 
Uh, the, the fears that we have about being too controlling uh, are either born of a false view of human uh, nature where we believe in uh, you know, inner children and uh, motivation and, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, those false views of human nature have to be set aside or they're based on laziness. Uh, we just don't want to be held accountable to the highest standards. Both of those need to be set aside so that we can get down to the business of properly engineering the human beings uh, to, to, to behave in the ways that we know they can and ought to be conditioned.